Thank you all for joining us today for what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion with Lord Andrew Roberts and Dr. Jonathan Spire. I'm Josh London, Chief Executive of the Anglo-Israel Association. Our primary purpose uh, at the AIA is to inform and educate the Anglo world about Israel, in particular the UK-Israel relationship, encouraging bilateral exchanges at every level, advancing mutual understanding, and amplifying the positive impact of these activities. For decades, the AIA has fostered goodwill between Brits and Israelis at the highest levels of public and intellectual life. As a UK charity which enjoys support from across the political spectrum, from people of many faiths, as well as none, every contribution matters to us. If you enjoy events like this, please help support our activities by making a donation via our, our website, angloisraelassociation.com, or email me directly at joshua at angloisraelassociation.com. We are honored to have with us today Lord Andrew Roberts, an eminent historian of war and author of some 20 books, which have been translated into 28 languages and have won 13 literary prizes. His most recent book is Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare, 1945 to Ukraine, which he co-authored with General David Petraeus. This is an incredibly readable, insightful, and thorough examination of key military conflicts over the past seven and a half decades. The book was released as the conflict between Hamas and Israel entered its second week. So it's uh, hot off the presses. I'm nearly done with it. I commend it to everyone. We are also joined from Israel by Dr. Jonathan Spire, journalist, author, and analyst of Middle East affairs. Jonathan is director of research at the Middle East Forum and edits the Forum's journal, The Middle East Quarterly. Jonathan is also a columnist at the Jerusalem Post and is a contributor to the Wall Street Journal and the Australian newspapers and to Jane's Intelligence Review. He has extensive experience as a correspondent in the field and has reported on conflict from Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Turkey, Ukraine, Jordan, Israel, West Bank, and Gaza. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics. Those joining us live are encouraged to post in the comments section where you're watching this event from. The comment section is also where you should submit any questions for our panelists, and we will try to address as many as possible during the Q&A portion of our event. Andrew, Jonathan, thank you for joining us today for this discussion. Analysis, insights, and prognosis on the Israel-Hamas war. On October 7th, on October 7th, uh, 2023, the day after the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, just over a month ago, Hamas, the Palestinian Arab terrorist group based in the Gaza Strip, began an unprovoked, devastating, and coordinated attack that shook southern and central Israel. The attack began at approximately 6.30 a.m. when Hamas launched a, mass, a, a massive rocket barrage targeting civilian areas. Simultaneously, the terrorists initiated multiple infiltration operations, breaching the security barrier and attacking multiple communities within Israel. The consequences of this attack are, are, are ongoing, but the most recent estimates of that day are that over 1,400 Israelis were murdered and thousands more have been wounded. This was the deadliest terror attack in Israel's history. In addition to casualties, there are still around 240 hostages who were taken by Hamas. In response, the state of Israel officially declared war. Israel's military launched Operation Swords of Iron, a sustained air, sea, and land campaign aimed at countering the Hamas security threat, ending Hamas rule in Gaza, and freeing the hostages. Let me turn first to Lloyd Roberts to get this discussion started. Andrew, uh, what are your thoughts on the war? Where are things headed? What may the future hold? Well, firstly, thank you very much indeed for um, inviting me along. Um, I've long been an admirer of your organisation, and it's a great honour to be able to uh, uh, address you. Um, I think it's useful. I would say this because I'm a historian to see these uh, to see this in its historical context. I was discussing this with David Petraeus um, quite recently. We uh, we brought out the book the week before the. Um, Hamas attack, and so we tried to uh, to work out when 
um, anybody, any leader since 1945 has been placed in such a fiendishly difficult situation as the Israeli high commander in at the moment, and we couldn't think of one. Um, it's uh, for all of the reasons that uh, Jonathan so um, so brilliantly set out in his Spectator article. In fact, this is just so difficult for um, for Israel. Um, the political situation which seems globally to be turning against Israel does mean that there's um, much less time than, say, the uh, Iraqis were able to use against ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda in, uh, in the battles of the um, 2016 that uh, period. The hostage situation makes the whole thing so much more difficult uh, domestically. The um, whole outcry about uh, humanitarian pauses and, and so on, which the Americans were uh, against um, in the UN on the 18th of October, but now they are in favour of. All of this is, the, is a backdrop against a uh, incredibly difficult tactical situation on the ground where you're fighting Hamas uh, amongst the rubble of um, of Gaza City. And as we've seen historically from uh, Stalingrad and uh, Monte Cassino and Fallujah and uh, Najaf and elsewhere, actually uh, rubble is more um, easy to defend than, uh, than, than buildings that haven't been blown up. So this is an incredibly difficult situation, whether it's existential like the Yom Kippur War um, depends very much on how it uh, how it um, goes the next stage that it goes to. But it seems to me that the IDF have gone about this uh, so far in the correct way. They haven't. Um, they, they've taken their time. Um, they didn't go in until the twenty seventh of uh, October, twenty days after the um, original uh, atrocities. And they uh, have cut off the north from the south successfully. Um, and on the assumption that they're able to destroy the tunnels between the north and the south, that does mean that there's no way for the um, for the Hamas fighters in the north to escape alive. So there is a, a sort of glimmer of hope, but the but the the complexities of this are unlike anything that uh, that David Petraeus and I have um, seen in the 24 or so contexts uh, since 1945. Jonathan, uh, what are some of your thoughts? First of all, I'm very much in agreement regarding the difficulties here and the way that I would uh, characterize it is that in a certain sense, there are three clocks ticking. Uh, which are not ticking in sync with one another, if one can put it that way. The first is the military clock. Israel has set as its goal the uh, collapsing or destruction of Hamas rule uh, in Gaza, and that is now underway, as, as Andrew correctly pointed out, in a systematic and cautious way, but moving forward up until now, I think in a way which we're all you know, cautiously satisfied with. But then secondly, again, as he, as he correctly pointed to, there is the diplomatic clock. And the diplomatic clock in Israel's wars also historically tends to run against Israel's interest. If we look back to history in October 1973, the Yom Kippur War, the, diplo the diplomacy kicked in before Israel had, from its own point of view, satisfactorily completed the military job of teaching the Egyptians it would not be worth trying to tangle with Israel again. In 2006 as well, in Lebanon, after three weeks of war, the United Nations Security Council 1701, deeply unsatisfactory as it has since proven to be was imposed on Israel before the fighting was properly concluded. So the diplomatic clock is running now as well. Uh, there clearly won't be uh, an infinite amount of time. As uh, Andrew said, the United States position, the support has been good and solid, but there does appear in the last few days to have been something of a shift towards entertaining the notion of humanitarian pauses. And of course, from an Israeli point of view, once you have a humanitarian pause in place, then how long will it be? How many more will then be asked for? How, when will it, or if the military will be given the chance to get back to doing its job? And the third fiendishly difficult clock that is ticking is that, of course, of the two, regarding the 240 hostages being held in Gaza. Israeli governments, the Israeli government has pointed out, has outlined a, a neat, but at least to me, not entirely satisfactory formula, where it said, well, the, the military and the hostages, you go together, go together, because the more we push militarily, the more flexible Hamas will cut, become with regard to the hostages. That sounds nice, 
I'm not quite sure, actually, if reality works that way. To some degree, I'm afraid, and it's a very difficult thing even to articulate and certainly to make policy on. These two clocks work against one another, the military and the hostages, and the hostages, in the sense that if you really do want to push forward and destroy Hamas governance, I'm afraid that may have implications and not good implications for the 240 of our fellow citizens being held. And if you really do want to stress the issue of the 240 hostages to the detriment of all others, that may well indeed have implications for your ability to pursue your military objectives. So three clocks running, not running in sync with one another, and sometimes also running against one another. Hmm. Now, of course, a, a complicating factor um, on top of these competing timelines uh, is um, the the fear, the threat, the possibility of uh, widening of conflict um, at any moment. Uh, perhaps, um, uh, Jonathan, maybe you can start. Um, explain to us some of what the of, of what the potential is, what the danger is, uh, just I initially operationally, but certainly geopolitically. Um, Sure. Well, first of all, the geopolitical and regional aspect of this is absolutely crucial and, and it needs to be front and center. It needs to be front and center for the following reason, because the military capacities that lay behind uh, Hamas's uh, ability to carry out the attacks on October the 7th are not the result simply of, I don't know, local Gazan ingenuity or something like that. They're because Hamas is and has been for a long period of time a member of a regional alliance led by Islamic Republic of Iran. We need to not simplify this, of course. Uh, relations between Iran and Hamas have not always been smooth. During the Syrian civil war, the period of the Arab Spring, the Sunni Islamist uprisings over the region going back now a decade, uh, Hamas tried to change sides and join in with some of the forces actually fighting against Iran's allies, for example, in Syria. Be that as it may, over the last three or four years, Hamas has found its way back under the Iranian umbrella. Iranian assistance, know-how, weaponry, capacity for teaching how to make weaponry, the whole list is absolutely crucial to Hamas. That doesn't mean, of course, that the Iranians were running events on a tactical level on the day on October 7th. We don't know that. But it does mean that without the Iranian uh, alliance, the Hamas attack would not have been uh, conceivable. Now, it does seem to me likely that Hamas was hoping that once things got going uh, in the south between Gaza and Israel, then its allies to the north, Hezbollah, and perhaps more further afield, would step in. They have stepped in, but they haven't gone fully in. That's to say Hezbollah is engaged on a northern front in Israel. There are daily uh, attacks using anti-tank rounds, missiles, rockets, uh, and the rest of it. Israeli communities, 28 communities have been evacuated in the north. Uh, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people have left their homes. And starting this week, uh, Hezbollah have begun to target Israeli civilians. An Israeli civilian, a man called Meir Moyal, killed in the Iftach area on uh, Monday this, this week, uh, starting that escalation process. But having said that, Nasrallah of Hezbollah's speech last Friday made very clear that Hezbollah does not intend at this stage to go all in. Behind the flowery rhetoric that the Hezbollah leader likes to go in for, were two very clear points uh, he made. The first, he said, was that October 7th was a purely Palestinian uh, effort. And the second, notably, was he said, those who say that Hezbollah sh should get involved should understand we are involved. We've already been involved since October 8th, which kind of meant, put into more simple uh, English, guys, Hamas, you're probably on your own in all this. So yes, they're involved, not fully in yet. The Houthis also in Yemen have carried out no less than four attacks on Israel, the last one being a medium-range ballistic missile, quite unprecedented, and would have been considered an act of war in any other context than the one we're currently in. So other Iranian assets being mobilized as well. And thirdly, and very notably, attacks by pro-Iranian uh, militias in Iraq and Syria on American targets, no less than uh, 38 attacks since October 7th on American targets in Iraq and in Syria. I think 46 people wounded, one contractor died, unfortunately, of a heart attack during one of the attacks. So the Iranian-led regional alliance is crucial to Hamas's success, and it is mobilizing to some degree on behalf of its ally, but not as much as Hamas would like, and not fully. Why not, just for one final point? Because I think that the Iran-led regional alliance is, to a considerable extent, deterred. It's noted the arrival of, uh, of uh, USS Gerald Ford Carrier Group, to the Mediterranean, the subsequent arrival of a second carrier group, USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, and the arrival indeed 
of a nuclear submarine also on uh, Saturday. So it's noted that the Americans are in the region and they're saying to the Iranians, as the president put it, don't. And it appears that the Iranians are taking that very seriously. I would suggest that the Iranians need to think carefully about this. I certainly hope they don't go full in, of course. But I do also think if they don't, they also are going to suffer a certain loss of face in the region. Let's say if it is seen, if Israel does, as I hope we will, pursue our war and against Hamas to a successful conclusion and Hamas rule in Gaza ends, it means that an important piece for the Iranians will have been, in a sense, taken off the board. And if the Iranians are then seen to have not done anything much to prevent that, a lot of their rhetoric over recent years will have been seen to have been largely hollow. So quite a lot is at stake here also for the Iran-led regional alliance. Hmm. Um, well, Lloyd Roberts, uh, Andrew, um, curious for, for your uh, assessment. Um, in terms of um, sort of the, the operational side of things, um, how, from reports that have come out so far, how, ha how has this conflict uh, shaped up um, in terms of the urban warfare we've seen in the past, um, the, um, uh, the nature of the challenges um, that, uh, that Israel has, has so far faced, and seemingly, uh, you know, we've been doing a terrific job, of it, but, um, but obviously it's only just started. It's only just started. And when one looks historically, some uh, some big attacks, one thinks of Mosul in 2016, that took eight months um, to uh, to finally um, uh, destroy the enemy. Eight months is not what uh, Israel has for all those reasons that Jonathan just gave with regard to the diplomatic uh, talk. Uh, clock ticking. And, um, and the actual uh, complexity of the operation it's really extraordinary in that, uh, and, I, and I think unprecedented on this scale, certainly historically, um, in that you have to go room by room, cellar by cellar. Um, you have, to, you have uh, of course, these uh, tunnels where Hamas can come up behind you. So you need to have large amounts of troops behind you uh, to, uh, to watch your back, as it were. They, uh, the uh, IEDs, the booby traps, the uh, every door a, a potential death trap is there. The um, Hamas, of course, have had months to uh, prepare for this. The way in which they were able to um, to play an intelligence blinder, frankly, uh, in um, the way that they passed information and orders uh, down the telephone lines in the um, in the tunnels and never actually went on to any uh, communications that uh, Israeli SIGINT would be able to uh, hack into. You know, it was a it was a um, an impressive operation. And so, when it comes to the actual, uh, as I say, cellar by cellar, room by room, house by house uh, fighting, that is historically, at least, always very um, very um, bloody. It, uh, at the moment, they've lost 34, the IDF have lost 34 men um, since going in on the 27th of October. I'm afraid to say, uh, although our hearts and prayers uh, must be with them, um, that that is only uh, just but the beginning um, of this. I mean, obviously, there are also 348 people, uh, IDF soldiers, who've died since the 7th of October, but 90% of them were killed um, uh, destroying Hamas in uh, in southern Israel. So this is going to uh, take a lot of lives. I think that will add to the third of the of the clocks, the ticking clocks. Um, of course, with uh, domestic uh, political opinion in in Israel, but that seems to be absolutely rock solid at the moment, despite obviously all the. Uh, um, the complications with regard to the hostages and and the hostages thing that's, that's also pretty unprecedented because um, of course any country that abides by the Geneva Convention doesn't take hostages uh, Hamas does not uh, abide by it and so you have this uh, this massive extra complication which it seems to me uh, in Western campuses and in the United Nations and then here in the streets of London where where I live no one, um, who is taking uh, the um, uh, the anti-Israeli point of view? Essentially, no one is uh, is putting, trying to put pressure on Hamas to release the hostages, which would, of course, immediately result in humanitarian pauses and and uh, and other things like that. So, uh, it's a as, as as Jonathan says, it's an incredibly complex and uh, and vicious political 
situation and military situation. But Jonathan, can I come uh, in on, yeah, please, just on the yeah. point which we didn't go into detail on, which Andrew mentioned, the intelligence uh, blinder, as he put it correctly, which Hamas played on the 7th and in the period preceding it. Absolutely, yes. This was uh, an enormous and unprecedented success for Hamas. And I think it's worth, well, years will be spent, I think, and you know, on considering what exactly happened and why. But I think it's worth dwelling on for a moment to, in our discussion to consider what the nature of this uh, intelligence blunder on the Israeli side was, and, and indeed blunder it was. Yes, there were mistakes in tactical intelligence, and Andrew correctly points to the way in which Hamas countered Israeli high-tech intelligence gathering capacities with low-tech or no-tech practices. Uh, this was something, though, again, which we ought to have been familiar with, because this is exactly what the Palestinian organizations were doing during the Second Intifada. They got around SIGINT by literally you know, writing stuff down on a pencil, on a piece of paper, and having a guy go you know, from one village to another, bringing the message. So these kind of methods we should have known about. I think, to me, the, uh, the, uh, we, we clearly didn't, but I think there was a bigger blunder here. And it was on the strategic and indeed the imaginative level. And it was that the Israeli uh, system, I think both political and indeed military, had concluded that Hamas had been successfully deterred, that Hamas had been in government now in Gaza for getting on for 16 years, that clearly a very, as in, that is the case, clearly a very corrupt Hamas leadership cohort had enriched itself enormously in that process and that therefore Hamas liked the status quo and surely would be committed to it. And this is the basic think, failure of imagination that had taken place. And here we go back to the ideas level to some degree, I think. I mean, what was not recognised was that this is a jihadi Islamist organisation fiercely and seriously committed to its goal of eradicating Israel. And while it may appear to be pragmatic at this or that point, you know, one should never for a moment, take one's eye, so to speak, off the off the situation. Complacency regarding it uh, is uh, forbidden. Now, this isn't easy, of course. Again, hindsight's very, very simple. Anybody can say, well, should have known. The point is that Israel, for all its capacities, does have limited resources, as does every country, looking at intelligence gathering and security arrangements. And if you put something in one place, that means, obviously, it can't be in another place. Israel prioritised the threat from the north, from Hezbollah, the, the regional threat from Iran, overall, of course, the uh, Iranian nuclear challenge, and in so doing, to some degree, downgraded the uh, the nature of Hamas and the nature of the threat it posed. To me, the initial, the, the cardinal mistake was on the strategic and uh, and uh, imaginative level, and then everything else that followed on from that, removing resources, even stopping listening. We're told uh, uh, eight two hundred, the military intelligence uh, SIGINT. Uh, unit even stopping listening to Hamas internal communications uh, in the months prior to the attack. All of that followed on from that uh, initial error. And I think a great deal will need to be thought about on every level in our systems when the fighting is finished and we need to start thinking about what we have to learn from this period. I think there are a couple of very interesting um, uh, lessons from history here, um, and uh, and Yom Kippur is one of them. You know, after the Six Day War and the and the success of the Six Day War, um, Israel Israel took its eye off the ball in uh, in October 1973, and uh, and that was obviously disastrous for uh, for the first um, two and a half weeks of of that war before uh, Israel came back. And as Jonathan uh, mentioned, um, the UN's imposed ceasefires. They also if you go back in history, imposed ceasefires, of course, in the 1948 war of uh, Israeli independence. So this is going to be a, a problem, especially if the Americans uh, do go down the route of, um, of attempting to impose humanitarian pauses. You know, it, Israel has not got very much time, as uh, as Jonathan pointed out, with the first of the of the, the second of the ticking clocks. I think also there's a historical precedent actually in the uh, in the way that the um, Nazis in uh, the Battle of the Bulge just prior to the Battle of Bulge basically dumped all SIGINT and uh, concentrated entirely on um, sorry dumped uh, communications over any airwaves at all which they feared the allies were able to um, to uh, crack the codes 
and uh, and really the attack uh, orders were given by hand off uh, from uh, motorbike um, dispatch riders, and uh, and you know if you have that, it is tremendously difficult to uh, to to deal with. But uh, as um, as Jonathan says, if you have an overarching uh, assumption, there's a kind of groupthink, uh, and groupthink can can uh, can grow and grow. And uh, if the assumption is that Hamas had been boxed in, was not actually going to be a serious threat, everybody could get on with the Abraham Accords, bring Saudi Arabia in, and and ultimately it was all going to be all right. That in and of itself is a uh, catastrophic mistake. Mm. Um, well, there's, there's lots of uh, fascinating uh, strands here to, to yank on. Uh, one one particular one that, that leaps to mind, uh, it be, in part because it's so much of um, a, a major thread that runs throughout much of this, um, Iran. Um, so the United States uh, ostensibly remains committed to um, its rapprochement um, at the diplomatic level in terms of the missile program. It's not clear whether any of that has been uh, changed or shifted uh, in light of uh, current events. Um, obviously, it's back channel, but... Um, besides the uh, the concern about America pushing for ceasefires or humanitarian pauses and, and all of that, um, if the administration, if the United States continues its um, coddling or uh, however you want to put it, um, you know, trying to play nice with Iran in order to bring about uh, some sort of diplomatic uh, breakthrough on, on that front, um, how does that complicate everything else? Uh, not not just in terms of Israel, but uh, the the Abraham Accords. Uh, you know, so much of that was based on the the shared strategic uh, values that the players in the region represented to each other, the the value proposition, because in part of the Iranian threat. Um, if anything, perhaps that's even more vibrant now. Uh, but. I'm curious about for your both of your uh, views on this, uh, and 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 ultimately the the underlying question is, um, will anyone confront Iran, or how might how how might Iran be confronted? Maybe I'll start. I mean, certainly in terms of uh, the immediate implications of the picture you pointed to to the war itself. My own view, at least, is that there was uh, and remains a very important security plank, so to speak, to the Abraham Accords, even if it's not the one that's most spoken about publicly. The notion that Israel uh, is a formidable uh, regional power undoubtedly underlies uh, the desire of such countries as United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and we hope also in the fullness of time, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, to pull closer to Israel. The economic and technological sides tend to be discussed more uh, publicly, but the military and security side are very, very important. And of course, the danger that those countries are concerned with is the regional ambitions or are the regional ambitions of Islamic Republic of Iran, which means that, in my view at least, uh, the importance of Israel coming up with a clear military result in the current uh, campaign is compounded. Israel needs, for the sake of successful diplomacy going forward in the region, to now deliver a successful military result. If there is an inconclusive military result, and certainly, you know, if Israel comes out of this looking, uh, looking directionless, and Hamas is able to spin it as a victory, then that will have knock-on implications for the image and indeed the reality of Israel as a potential uh, partner on hard security and strategic issues. Uh, going forward. This is one thing. And the second point I'd like to make is the following. Uh, yeah, you talked about the US administration. This, uh, and you accurately, I think, characterized the approach this administration has taken to Iran. The administration, as all administrations, can be forgiven for having illusions at the beginning. But at a certain point, illusions need to you know, dissipate in, the li in light of experience. This is no longer a new administration. This administration has had the experience now of a failed uh, attempt at a return to the JCPOA, a uh, fruitless negotiation now abandoned in Vienna. This administration has tried very hard through financial inducements, six, seven billion dollars uh, coming back online for the Iranians to induce the Iranians towards more normal uh, regional behavior as a, as a regional state. And none of that has borne any fruit. And what we see rather, and this is stuff which I write on quite a bit, 
What we see rather is the onward march of the Iranian project for regional domination. The Iranians now dominate Lebanon more or less openly through the Hezbollah organization. They dominate Iraq now more or less openly through the Iran-supported government of Prime Minister Mohammad Shia Sudani. They dominate Yemen, or at least the capital and a large part of it, through their, through their Houthi uh, allies. They dominate Syria as well, having now, of course, saved successfully the brutal uh, regime of President Bashar Assad. So their regional project is marching forward. The attempt to deal with that project by detente and inducement, which is what this administration has been engaged with, has not worked. And I think that what's currently happening in the region, which I mentioned and we've we've discussed uh, in, in the earlier minutes of this discussion, uh, ought to be now concentrating American minds on the notion that the approach may have been mistaken. You know, when you have no less than 38 attacks, as I mentioned, on U.S. installations, when you have, you know, if I say, when you have uh, openly acts of war being carried out on a regional ally, Israel, by an Iranian proxy, the Houthis, up to and including the launching of medium-range ballistic missiles, this ought to now be teaching uh, uh, the, uh, the centers of power, so to speak, in Washington, that this Iranian regional project is a deeply, is the deeply dangerous challenge uh, in the Middle East, that it is aligning increasingly with the global challenges to the United States and its uh, rules-led international order, as it's called, that's to say, the Russian and Chinese interests, and that therefore there needs to be a changing of the disk, so to speak, from this notion that inducement can bring the Iranian regime towards normality. It can't. That notion needs to be changed and policy needs to be built on the basis of that altered view, I would say. I agree. I, I think the... Um a lot of this does depend on whether or not Iran is a, a sort of rational actor. Um, and my one of my uh, fears about this is that uh, it could just get so badly out of control with lots of other things going on, like Hezbollah launching its 150,000 rockets or Syrian militias trying to take the Golan Heights or um, any serious... We haven't really talked about uh, what's happening in the West Bank. There have been uh, 150 or so Palestinians killed in the West Bank over... Um, the last month, and uh, and in Israel itself, so uh, with the with the uh, Palestinian Arabs who live in Israel, so there are so many moving sort of cogs. What if at the crisis point, when the IDF was is is deep into southern Gaza, which it has to go to after having annihilated. Um, Hamas in northern Gaza, what if you then get a dash for nuclear enrichment uh, from Iran? That's a uh, they you know, they've been teetering on um, on the on the brink of it for well twenty years now. What if they consider this to be the absolute ideal time to go for it? Does one assume that the Biden administration has got the uh, intestinal fortitude to prevent that, or that Israel has? Um, it's uh, it's a as I say, it's a um, nerve-wracking situation now, much more nerve-wracking, I think, for Israel than anything since those first two weeks of the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago. Well, that brings up, I mean, again, it's just a whole variety of threads one can can pull on. Um, one, Im one immediate thought leaps to mind. Um, so uh, just the, the mention of Yom Kippur, the uh, hanging over the heads of, of the Israeli government is the fact that uh, whenever the hostilities are brought to a conclusion, satisfactory conclusion by the Israelis, um, there'll be a reckoning, um, you know, politically and presumptively, uh, as in the past, most most folks in power will be shown the door. Um, but uh, you know, so total is the was the failure on the day that it seems uh, that exactly how the con how the conflict unfolds and how it, it is finally sort of brought to conclusion will perhaps change rather dramatically what the potential fallout is uh and it, in ways that are entirely unforeseen i mean uh, jonathan correct me if i'm wrong but the um the impact of all this on on israel as a nation uh, across the different sectors including you know to some degree Haredi and israeli arab and um, is just like nothing that's ever been witnessed or experienced before. It, it, am, I, am I correct in that? Certainly in recent decades, yeah. I think that uh, one of the interesting immediate uh, products of, of October 7th has been uh, a very profound coming together 
of the various sections of the you know, hitherto uh, deeply divided and even tribalized, one could say, Israeli public. I mean, it's kind of fascinating in a way to think that we've just come through prior to October 7th, perhaps one of the most fraught uh, periods for Israel in terms of domestic divisions that exists within living memory regarding the uh, proposed uh, judicial reform of the Netanyahu government and the very, very fierce opposition to that on the sort of public and street level of uh, opponents of the government. I don't remember a time, and I've been in Israel now for over three decades, and I don't remember a time when on the domestic level things were more you know, uh, ten tense and difficult than that. That all disappeared overnight on October 7th. And we're now witnessing these, you know, quite genuinely sort of heartwarming scenes in which the ultra-Orthodox population, many of whom, of course, don't have military experience of their own, are trying very hard to volunteer and to be involved in all sorts of civil society uh, initiatives. And indeed, civil society has responded, you know, profoundly well to this. I think I mean, the levels of volunteering on, on the social level in, in Israel right now are, are, you know, fantastic. So, yes, that's the initial reaction has been good. In terms of the broader political implications that you point to, absolutely, there's going to be an enormous, uh, profoundly deep political reckoning uh, after all this. And it has to be said, frankly, you know, politics doesn't stop even during wartime. Andrew, of course, has written about this in all kinds of ways in, in his works over the years that I'm familiar with. You know, it, it, it would be nice to say everyone just gets together and in the war efforts, the only thing that matters. That's not the way things work and it's not the way it's working in Israel now either. Clearly the people around the Prime Minister are already thinking about how, how's this going to look, what's the discussion going to look like later on. Uh, the Prime Minister has accepted responsibility but he's been careful in his wording. Certainly his opponents are convinced that he's going to try and find his way out of it one way or another. All the parallels with what took place after the Yom Kippur War of 73 are already uh, being talked about. How much did the Prime Minister know prior to October 7th? How much should he have known? How much can he reasonably claim not to have known and therefore, etc., etc., etc.? This stuff's already being uh, rehearsed and there's going to be, I think, uh, an enormous reckoning. I think what the people around the Prime Minister appear to be looking for uh, is that when, in contrast to the 1973 Yom Kippur War, is whether the Prime Minister, whether it can be said that the Prime Minister was warned and ignored warnings in the way that Prime Minister Golda Meir could be accused of doing, not from her military intelligence person, Nelly Zira, who, of course, was saying to her everything was going to be OK, but from other parts of the system. So the question, one question already being sort of surfacing is, can the Prime Minister say, contrast to 73, actually, the entire system didn't warn me. I was given no information from any branch of our military or intelligence that could have induced me to acting differently? Or is it the case that some kind of information, some sort of warnings were being received? This is all going to be dealt with in a very, very fraught, I suspect, way, uh, almost as soon as the guns stop firing, when they do stop firing in the, uh, the months ahead. I agree with all of that. Um, I think that uh, another very important aspect that uh, we need to talk about is uh, is the, the positive thing that can be uh, sort of promised, not just to Israel, but to the um, to the region after the destruction of Hamas. Obviously, I mean, the military destruction of Hamas in Gaza, there will always be Hamas because it will be all over the Arab world and they will have their, uh, their people, but they won't be able, hopefully, by the end of this operation to actually be able to uh, uh, carry out attacks on Israelis. And so that is going to be a, a changed world world. Who is going to run Gaza um, afterwards? What's the um, situation with regard to a two-state uh, solution going to look like? How much are the Arab countries going to involve themselves? Will Saudi Arabia finance the um, rebuilding of Gaza? You know, these are huge, uh, important issues. And if you can, in some way, offer people hope, um, then you tend to do uh, a lot better, especially in counterinsurgency operations. Historically, in this book uh, that David uh, Petraeus and I have written, we come up with about a dozen different scenarios for um, for wars. Uh, none of them wars like this, I, ha I have to say. Really important that I point that out. But nonetheless, um, one aspect that is very useful is if you have, if you can offer some kind of hope uh, to people whilst the war's being fought. 
Well, that that raises um, uh, an interesting point about sort of the ideology of, of Hamas and and fellow traveler uh, uh, Islamist um, groups, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, to a lesser extent Fatah, the ones who aren't thoroughly corrupted. Um, but so that points to a larger question um, about um, the sort of the the will of the people, if you will. The the uh, is there anything to suggest that Gazans look forward to being freed of Hamas rule? Look forward to being you know we everyone else is quick, Israelis included, are quick to to highlight that Hamas doesn't speak for the people of Gaza, that they're being abused, they're being you all of which is true. But the question, I guess, is. Um, do, the, do do the people of Gaza look forward to um, to the day after in the way that we think they might? Um, will they welcome an Israeli presence? Will they welcome an international presence? Will they welcome, you know, how do we get to the next stage? What, regardless of whatever the big idea is of what that might look like, just getting from A to B, how, how does that happen? Um, for me, I, you know, I do think we have to be careful with this because it would be convenient and nice to construct a view which says that sort of, you know, the population of Gaza are, are hostages also and that all that's needed to be done is that as we remove the uh, dictatorship imposed upon them and then it'll be, you know, not plain sailing, but it, no one would say that, but it'll be, you know, it'll fall into place following that. Yeah. This is something which is difficult to sometimes discuss, you know, publicly, and people tend to avoid it. I would like to address it head on. The fact of the matter is the following. Certainly in terms of the most important polling of all, namely actual election results in our neighbourhood, all the way down to Egypt and all the way up to, you know, Palestinians and up to Lebanon and uh, uh, all the way to Iraq, when the local populations get the chance to vote, they have tended to choose political Islam. And that's uh, something which is verifiable. I said there's been one real free election uh, in Egypt uh, in 2011, 2012, and the Muslim Brothers won. There's been one free election in the Palestinian territories. The last one was in 2006. And that was the one that basically introduced Hamas as a governing authority onto the stage. And so on and so on further, up, further along up the neighborhood. In Syria, there's never been elections, of course, but certainly the popular uprising against the Assad regime uh, beginning in 2011, 2012 also, very rapidly took on uh, the coloration of and became dominated by Islamist movements. So I'm afraid it is one of the realities we have to contend with in looking at our region is that Islamism, when it comes to street level, appears to have a great deal of public support. Now, one would hope that after 16 years or 17 years of disastrous misgovernance by Hamas of the Gaza Strip, culminating in the disaster that Gazans are currently experiencing. That might have served to dent some of that, but I wouldn't count on anything. Uh, we need to be thinking, if we think about a post, a period in which Hamas governance in Gaza has been destroyed, uh, we need to be thinking in terms of the fact there will probably be a post-Hamas insurgency carried out by the remnants of Hamas and other Islamist elements, and we should not assume that that insurgency will have no popular uh, legitimacy. And as Andrew correctly points out, we should be thinking about ways in which we can counter that. I absolutely agree that at the end of the day, uh, or, or I, it's my view that at the end of the day, what's happening and what will happen within Gaza also exists within the rubric, in a sense, set out by the Abraham Accords or the uh, challenge put out by the Abraham Accords, which at their deepest level were an attempt to try to say to the populations of the Arabic speaking world, there is another way of doing this. There is another way of developing societies. There's another way of being Islamic. There's another way of being traditional. There's another way of engaging with the world than the way in which it has been uh, largely practiced over recent uh, years. But that's the very beginning of a discussion, not the conclusion of a discussion. Political Islam has very deep levels of support uh, in the publics uh, of the Levant, the Arabic speaking publics of the Levant, and this current war won't have changed that, and we will confront that, I would suggest, in the moment following the deposing of the Hamas authority in Gaza. I, I think that's um, that's right. You also, of course, have the on the on the actual day of the seventh of October, large crowds in Gaza uh, City uh, cheering the um, the um, 
capture of the hostages and the hostages that were being taken through the streets uh, of Gaza. You know, I'm afraid ordinary, ordinary Gazans were um, elated by that and uh, and they were um, applauding. So, you know, that isn't a good sign either. Um, with regard to whatever happens, uh, whatever finally happens, the international community can't allow a Gaza and indeed a West Bank uh, where eight-year-old children are taught that it's a good thing to kill Jews. If th that is the thing that's going to make this generational, for another generation as well as the last three generations, um, in uh, in in the Holy Land, it's a it's going to uh, going to um, poison. Um, relations forever. If you have an education system with the textbooks that they presently have, uh, the uh, Palestinian Arabs. So that is something that uh, whoever ultimately wins is going to have to uh, is going to have to deal with. When I say wins, Israel is going to win, but I mean uh, whoever actually um, rules over Gaza. Yeah. Well, there's, uh, once again, there's a tremendous um, uh, amount of material packed in here. Uh, being mindful of the time, however, um, I did promise that we would try to get some to some uh, audience Q and A. Um, I've been monitoring the questions that, as they've come in and reshaped a few of them in the course of it, and we've addressed many of them. But nonetheless, let's um, let me just run through some of these real fast. Uh, some of these can be quick, but for example, uh, what's the estimated number of uh, Hamas fighters? Do we think what kind of force are they are they looking at? The term that I the the, the number I'm familiar with is thirty thousand. That's the one that I'm familiar with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's uh, that's what I hear too. Um, and uh, just shifting ground a little bit, uh, we have a question about um, what, uh, if anything, or in, in what way, or whatever, or the Red Cross, Red Crescent. Uh, and other humanitarian groups, um, what are they saying? What are they doing? What does that involvement look like? There are humanitarian uh, convoys making their way in, of course. There's, it's not on the same level as uh, as was the case before the war, fairly obviously. But, uh, you know, that's an ongoing discussion. Obviously, the Rafah crossing in the south is the place where stuff can go in, and there is there, there is aid coming in. But th there is a kind of point to be made here, I think, as well, which I think Israeli government spokespeople are trying to get across, is that, you know, we are in a war here. We are in, a, you know, a situation of armed open warfare between two entities, the State of Israel, uh, Hamas controlled, the Hamas entity in Gaza, and it was the latter entity which attacked the former one on October 7th. So the notion that sort of Israel's under some obvious obligation according to this or that standard to provide goods and and health care and whatnot to the population of an enemy state with which it is at war i would say uh, is a problematic one and we need to think about that yeah I, I i agree completely the the geneva convention doesn't in any way say that it's the duty of a country that's at war with another country to provide um food and medicine and water and electricity to the country at which with which it's at war um and we can get uh, we can get into the sort of muddy area of uh, of humanitarian aid uh it's a it's a a good and nice thing and we'll all feel much uh, uh, warmer inside if it happens but you can't in any way in any way um vitiate military operations as a, as a result of it the best way to uh, provide humanitarian assistance to gazans is to destroy hamas as soon as possible and if the idf feel that they can do that better without these humanitarian pauses, then it is incumbent on uh, the rest of the world to stand back and allow um, Israel to get on with this incredibly difficult job. A right. um, uh, question, uh, we've touched on it a little bit, but um, I think it, it, it's worth revisiting. Um, there's a the question here was posed to, to Jonathan, but uh, really it's for both of you. Um, how high a risk do you see of a major conflagration between Israel and the West Bank Palestinian Arabs, um, either in terms of, um, you know, terrorists? Uh, I, I know the Israelis have been arresting known terrorists or terrorists that they identify in the region, uh, in, in the sector. Um, but but how much concern is there about a, a, a changing of opinion, um, you know, more of the of the, the lone wolf style, which has been a little bit of, uh, particularly as the propaganda battle continues and, and you know, the media seem to adopt the, the, the Hamas talking points and images 
without question. Um, so that clearly is going to inflame. What, what, what's the risk look like? First of all, the risk is a real one, and it's no longer only about uh, lone wolf terrorism, which, as you correctly point to, has been an issue now going back uh, in, in an, uh, an inflated way three or four years. But there's a over the last year or so, it's been clear that there's an additional, uh, more organised danger coming specifically out of the northern West Bank and specifically out of the cities of Jenin and Nablus. What we've witnessed there, or are witnessing there, is the creation of new military organisations from the ground uh, with access to weaponry, with will to carry out attacks, with money, and then the linking of those organizations, both to existing Palestinian organizations, specifically Islamic Jihad and Hamas, and from there to uh, Iranian uh, structures of support. Basically, what we've seen this year is very advanced uh, weaponry, including EFPs, explosively formed penetrators, the kind of stuff that was used uh, against British forces uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, familiarly over recent years, finding their way into the towns of the northern West Bank. Where is this stuff coming from? It's coming in from Syria. It's following the same smuggling routes that the caps are gone, the drugs that uh, the uh, Hezbollah and the Iranians smuggle in from Lebanon and Syria to Jordan, and in that case, then down to the Gulf. In this case, following the same routes, involving the same tribes, the same linkages, linkages, the same alliances, coming down from Syria through Jordan and then into the West Bank. So we have already an emergent situation of new militias with uh, enthusiastic memberships in at least part of the West Bank, which are now finding their way to Iranian structures of power and thence to and thence being provided for by uh, Iranian uh, with Iranian uh, weaponry. Um, that's where things currently sta stand. The question is, does that then explode into something much bigger uh, as a result of the current events uh, in Gaza? One thing which I think may well militate against that happening is that it's very obviously a shared interest of both Israel and the Ramallah-based Palestinian Authority that that should not happen. And currently, at least, the uh, security dominance, so to speak, throughout the West Bank is in the hands of Israel, together with and in partnership with, often, the security uh, structures of the Ramallah Palestinian Authority. The last thing they need is exactly what Hamas wants, which is the emergence of a popular armed uprising on the ground in the West Bank, inspired by or led by uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad and Iran. So my sense is there's an awareness of that and therefore all sorts of me possible measures have been taken to prevent it. But yes, we are, uh, and Andrew was the first to mention it in this discussion, we would be fools to take our eye off that ball as well. You know, in addition to the North, in addition to Gaza, the West Bank is uh, an ongoing problem that we need to uh, to think about tactically now that the guns are blazing, so to speak, down in Gaza, and in the long term also strategically once uh, the uh, the fight fighting ceases. I think that's right. I think the uh, last thing the Palestinian Authority wants to see is to a return to 2005 um, and uh, and the way that it was uh, it was destroyed in in Gaza. Um, I was pleased also, uh, Josh, when you mentioned propaganda, because I think that's a very important aspect of this uh, whole uh, struggle that we haven't really um, uh, engaged with yet. Disinformation is always important in all wars. Um, in in my uh, book, I go into it in in some uh, to some <clears throat> great extent, owing to the fact that the um, technological advances that are taking place with regard to deep fakes and and uh, and bots and so on are. Uh, um, are going to make this more and more important in uh, in the future, and it's harder and harder to tell the difference between propaganda and and truth. And with regard to uh, Hamas, it has been surprisingly impressive. Again, a bit like the uh, intelligence, um, the uh, the world wa was lulled into thinking that it was an Israeli. Um, a uh, rocket that killed 471 people classic hamas giving you the exact number in a in a situation where you know you can't get exact numbers in the uh, in the hospital that it turned out that islamic jihad had actually bombed the uh, car park off and and um or at least the rocket had uh, gone off there and and killed about 50 people so if they will multiply the number by nine times how on earth, why is it that the whole of the western media 
um, just swallows every number that they come out with when it comes to Palestinian dead, especially dead children. But you can't do that. Disinformation and propaganda are essential in wars. They take place in every single war. And Hamas's, um, the health uh, authorities in Palestine, in uh, Gaza, are an adjunct of the Hamas propaganda arm. And I think that uh, Western news uh, agencies and media really should uh, um, factor that in in a way they don't really at the moment. Yeah, I think that's a crucial point. And I would add to that that uh, just in the last few days, Israel has begun to uh, escort uh, certain foreign reporters into the Gaza Strip, you know, to, where they can then film and speak to Israeli forces there. And I'm noticing, which of course is fair enough, I'm noticing that CNN and other channels in their reports on this are saying, you know, we had to submit some of our pictures here to the IDF prior to it being brought. But that's a perfectly fair thing for them to point out. And it's perfectly fair also for the IDF to insist on that, of course, in an operational context. But there should be a parallel to that, that, that you know, media companies, media channels should also say anything that's coming out of Gaza, anything that's based on figures, you know, again, from the so-called Palestinian Health Ministry, IEA, Hamas controlled institution, it should also be pointed out that that's the case and should therefore be approached with the uh, appropriate scepticism. Exactly. And um, so uh, I'm curious then just to follow up quickly on this and, and again, kind of linking a couple of the questions I've seen, but um, to what degree is the, does the, is the propaganda danger, not just on regionally in terms of the Arab street, so to speak, um, but uh, in the West, right? We've seen uh, increasingly strong demonstrations ostensibly of support for Hamas in some cases explicitly so, um, and from, you know, citadels of higher education, uh, from, you know, other other um, uh, presumptively uh, or supposedly elite and refined uh, quarters, um, there's the politics here, right? At a certain point, um, there's a numbers game in terms of votes for, for politicians who are uh, of that disposition. Um, what what sort of concern ought uh, ought we to have uh, we uh, watching this certainly israel uh, um, forced to contend with all the moving pieces um and 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 allies of uh, of israel uh, so even for example even if the united kingdom uh, wants to, you know if the government wants to continue to to hold fast as it has done a, a superb job of doing um you know when when quarters start demanding alternatives uh, and that starts to impact other nations uh, and and um the conversation. How does one contend with that? Um, if, if I could just uh, start off with an answer to that from the from the English uh, from the British perspective, uh, a lot of this is is frankly a numbers game. You know, there are some forty Labour uh, seats, which in which the um, uh, the number of um, the percentage of uh, of Muslim voters is thirty percent and or over, and some of them it's over fifty percent. So, so. You're going to have, and there are only a quarter of a million Jews in uh, in the United Kingdom against about two and a half million um, Muslims. So ultimately, you're going to have a problem with regard to uh, to the political power that one side's going to have versus the versus the other, and it's only going in in one direction. Uh, we've seen absolutely shocking, shocking examples of overt anti-Semitism in the street hate speech, um, people who cover their faces, even though that's actually against the law in demonstrations, and the police doing very little or nothing about it. Uh, on Saturday, this coming Saturday, there's likely to be a, a monster rally. Hopefully it will be, won't be able to be heard from the Remembrance Day uh, service in, in Whitehall, but um, nonetheless, uh, the um, the police are deliberately taking a very low um, profile stance on this. We'll see whether they're right or not. But um, it is uh, a, a sort of propaganda battle that I'm afraid it seems to be being lost here in uh, in England, despite the fact, as you say correctly, the British government is taking a, uh, a very strong um, stance so far, at least. One thing I'd like to add to that, I was sitting here in, in Jerusalem, it's interesting to note that to a great extent that the really dangerous sort of levels of popular fury that we seem to be witnessing on this, not to be complacent regarding the region, but are actually not happening in the, in the Arabic-speaking world from the famous uh, Arab streets, but are actually most notable in the West and in Western capitals, and, and certainly absolutely London being 
one of them, I think also uh, in, in France, and I think also in the United States as well. You know, uh, to some degree, I think in, in the way that war tends to sort of bring things to a head and, and speed things up, these seem to me to be the coming together of developments that we've been kind of aware of for a long period of time, perhaps most notably the very curious uh, alliance in certain in, in a number of Western countries between the forces of Islamism, of political Islam on the one hand, and then kind of the radical left on the other. You know, entirely counterintuitive, if not absurd on an intellectual level, where they are in fact substantively enemies of one another on any on, on almost all given issues. But it seems that this kind of quite toxic coming together, uh, you know, is now really bearing consequence in the presence of tens or even hundreds of thousands of demonstrators on the streets of, uh, of a number of Western capitals. Yeah, we're at the situation where the neo-Nazis um, have now called off their um, their anti-Muslim demonstration because they don't want to be seen as being pro-Jewish. So uh, it's a uh, it's a very weird thing. And as for the people who are waving the flags, uh, queers for Palestine, you just think, oh, if only you really did spend two days in uh, in Gaza, you'd recognise um, quite what an absolutely ludicrous absurdity that is. There are there are I mean. There's, as well as obviously being uh, a lot of, of um, uh, ideologically committed people, there are, especially in our universities, I'm afraid to say, and in our elite universities, uh, a lot of idiots, just incredibly stupid people who haven't put two and two together, who still see this whole issue of, the, of Israel and the Middle East through the lens of the co colonialism and settlers and, and so on, who don't read their history, who don't know what was in the... Uh, Balfour Declaration, and who don't care? They just want to um, to posture and to uh, mm -hmm. and to infuriate and to uh, essentially um, uh, act like children. Hmm. Well, on that uh, badly sobering note, um, so uh, we have promised uh, the audience uh, one hour. We we are just over that now. Um, any, uh, I guess, very quickly, any final thoughts, um, and then uh, then we'll wrap up. But um, uh, again, I want to thank you both for participating in, in what uh, I thought was a, a very fascinating um, discussion, one which I think could have gone on substantially longer. Unfortunately, I promised you um, a lot less time than that. So, <laughs> My last thought, I think, would be um, that we've seen before in history what it takes to extirpate a organization, a government that is not interested in the well-being of its people. It just wants to kill as many Jews as possible. And uh, finally, that happened in 1945. Um, and so our our thoughts and hopes and prayers should be with the men of the IDF, men and women of the IDF, uh, as they uh, undertake this grueling and fiendishly difficult, but ultimately absolutely necessary task. Yeah, I completely agree. Just in very in a few seconds, just to say that back to where we started with regard to the potential uh, tension between the military and the diplomatic side, you know, I sincerely hope it is the case that the diplomatic side with regard to the West and potential Western pressure on Israel can be held off for that sufficient amount of time that the IDF, that our, our military uh, can head forward and complete the job, not only for Israel's benefit, but I do think also for the benefit of, uh, of the entire Western world in terms of the urgent need for, for, for the Hamas uh, authority in Gaza to, uh, to disappear. Yeah. Well, again, thank you both for your time. Um, perhaps we can uh, do this again. Uh, if, if we're lucky, there'll be some better news at some stage of this. Um, uh, still early days yet. Again, uh, Lord Andrew Roberts, Dr. Jonathan Spire, thank you both for joining us. Thank you to all in the audience for taking time uh, to participate. Um, take care. Have a good day. Thanks.